talk to Bibi to open the gate on the Israeli side. You're now rewriting history online. Why are they lying to you about this? And anytime you hear the word they, like buckle up, you're about to get a, like a sweet conspiracy theory. But I maintain that the Fruit of the Loom thing, I, I know what I saw. What I do know is I sat through two and a half hours of like history. Joe Biden was in the middle of a press conference in which he was trying to make his case to the American people that he was not senile. John Stewart comes back at his killer segment. It's about Biden's age. I thought his monologue was pretty trite. I mean, I guess I have to give him credit for actually pointing out the obvious. Her name is Tiffany Inyard. If she loses election, the salary will go to $25,000 a year. But if she wins, <laughs> it will stay the same. That's crazy. Preschool teacher fired for like an OnlyFans account, okay? The picture that is linked is of one Rachel Dolezal. She's got a great body for a woman of her age. <laughs> you looked at her OnlyFans? Welcome back to the pod, guys. Uh, we have a lot to cover today, so I want to get into it right up front. I want to talk about this. I want to talk about, it's a piece of the Super Bowl that nobody gave a shit about at all for the first time in my entire life. Um, and they didn't care. Like, so this year, no one cared. I want to talk about it. It's the Super Bowl halftime show. And I'm going to take a weird angle about it. It's not, I don't care about Usher. Okay. I'm not here to do what we typically do, which is like, was the halftime show good? Was it bad? I feel like this one was bad. Not the topic in our discussion. He had a guest star, Alicia Keys. And there was a voice. She had a little, a little bit of a voice crack when she sort of first started singing. Some people want it all, but I don't. Um, again, still don't care. Not interesting. What is interesting about this voice crack? And I mean, I have a lot to talk about it here. I, I want to really get into this because we've written a lot about this uh, at Pyre Wires. I certainly have. Um, it was erased. Some So in in subsequent like released recordings of this live show, which you know 150 million Americans watched and saw happen, um, the voice crack is no longer there. And uh, this is on Apple as well as uh, the official like Super Bowl YouTube channel. Um, I have heard reports that videos with the crack were taken down. I tried to confirm that before the show. I haven't seen that. Um, I, I haven't. I don't have any hard evidence of that. Uh, but what this is to me, this is fascinating. So you have a moment that everybody in America sees that now for the rest of time will be just a story we tell. Meanwhile, the actual recorded record is something that did not happen. Okay. It's a small difference. And I think here people, maybe you're thinking like, what's, uh, maybe some people are thinking, well, what's the big deal about this? Who cares? Um, that the voice crack was smoothed over is maybe this not sort of dissimilar from, uh, I don't know, lip syncing or something like that. I think it's fundamentally different. You lip sync on a, at a show, that's the recording, that's history. We saw it happen, okay? You're now rewriting history online. Now, I've read about something adjacent to this in a piece called Variant Z, in a piece called Encyclopedia Titanica, in a piece called Tether. I wrote about this. We are losing our history. So like the weird thing about the internet is when we all went online, uh, the promise of that in the early 2000s was just like unlimited information and we would have all of the world's information at our fingertips. What actually happened, so that happened, we have unlimited information. What we sort of didn't see coming was that it changes and uh, like actually physically the things, the, the record can be changed. Now, once you stop producing that, uh, once you stop having like a hardcover, say encyclopedia or something, and and the definitions of words and things over the last 20 years or things that even events that happen on Wikipedia and whatnot are being edited in real time, you lose your sense of common shared reality. Um, now, I guess there's a question of whether or not that ever existed in the first place, which we can get into in a second. Uh, but I want to leave you with one more serious... So you have the voice crack. Um, I think a more interesting and really serious example of this was uh, something I wrote about at the time that it happened in a, a piece called Tether. Um, the congressional hearing for now Chief Justice Amy Coney Barrett. So in her hearing, she was uh, it was asked about some gay question and she was like the typical song and dance where she has to pretend that she's not homophobic. Maybe she's not. Maybe she is. I don't know. But she had to prove that she was not homophobic. I don't think she is. She had to prove it in, in, front, of, uh, in front of Congress. 
And she started talking about this. You know, she said, you know, I'm not homophobic. I don't care. Um, you know, anyone's sexual preference is their business, blah, blah, blah. Immediately following that, a Huffington Post reporter wrote a piece saying that sexual, pre- Amy Coney-, Coney Barrett uses like this bigoted phrase, sexual preference. And it goes viral and everyone's attacking her. All the left is sort of attacking Amy for using the, the phrase sexual preference. And I'm scratching my head because I'm like, it's definitely dated, but I don't think it's, it's not offensive. Sexual preference. I'm not offended by sexual preference. Is that offense? Are people, I didn't even, I had earnestly not received the memo. Um, neither did the dictionary because that definition changed in real time. The definition, the, when you type up sexual preference, you Google it, you go to the dictionary, the Webster's definition, it it changed to include that this was now offensive. Um, so I think this is like the roughly the theme that I'm interested in. This is the, the topic that comes up again and again uh, at Pirate Wires because I think it is this like very important aspect of our information landscape right now that continues to be underexplored, um, not taken seriously. And uh, yeah, I think it's, a, I think it's, I think it's incredibly important. Um, so I don't know, rough thoughts. I, I, maybe I want to start with River. You were kind of nodding along maybe to the Amy uh, Barrett piece. What, how, what was your take on oh, that? Oh yeah, that was stupid. I, I just remember thinking at the time I was like, well, I mean, I tried both and I preferred men. So, I mean, that is why I'm gay. <laughs> like it is a preference. You know what I mean? <laughs> I didn't hate it. It was just, I, you know, I preferred, <laughs> but no, I mean, it is, I mean, this sort of thing has happened like for a long time. I mean, you read about it like in Orwell or whatever, because it happened in the Soviet Union. Stalin's like editing Trotsky out of uh, official portraits of like the Bolsheviks and all of that. Um, my super Catholic great grandma used to cut ex- people's ex wives out of the family photos. But like, <laughs> so people have been doing this for a while. But <laughs> I-, I really remember the first time I-, I noticed this was, you know, the movie Avatar, like James Cameron's movie Avatar. Oh, yeah. You know the scene where the blue people are like having sex, I guess, but it's like with their tails and like the the little tendrils or they connect <laughs> the tails and that's yeah. how they like fuck, I guess. Yeah, it's weird. Okay, that was edited out. That's if you rent that movie on Amazon Prime right now, it's gone. I thought I was losing my mind because I, or I was like watching it on Amazon Prime and I was like, I remember this scene. I remember being in like 14 in a movie theater seeing this and laughing because I thought it was like, so weird and ridiculous and i like i thought i was losing my mind and so i was like googling i was like <laughs> deleted scene blue people f-ing, like you know whatever had to like sift through all the porn but then i found like a reddit where other people were like no i remember this they took it out and it's like yeah james cameron because people made fun of that scene so he took it out there are a handful of uh examples of this in film actually we published a piece by kat rosenfeld called gaslight And I mean, she goes, she goes into them. They were, she was focusing on, uh, what I saw as it was like kind of this woke erasing of things, which is classically like Chinese cultural revolution status, you know, to go back and, and, and transform art. Um, I noticed it recently in Aladdin though. I was watching, uh, maybe like a year ago, I, I turned on, uh, the, the cartoon Aladdin. I'd seen the live action and I wanted to, I was like, I forget what I want to kind of compare it to the original that I remembered. And they altered, uh, they altered the beginning because it was considered, I guess, um, anti Muslim or something. It was some version of this thing that we always hear. Um, and in the small details, it feels like not so big of a deal, but in aggregate, it feels like we don't have history anymore. It feels like if anything can change at any time for any reason, um, and there's no record and they can actually go into like, you buy the, you buy the video game or the movie, um, on Amazon and the thing that you buy can be altered remotely. Uh, that is very alarming. And I know it's, again, it, these things seem trivial. These are the examples that we are catching and seeing. I think it's happening all the time. And, uh, in, again, in aggregate, that starts to feel like, you know, the sand of, of, of civilization, like slipping out from underneath you. And, um, uh, I don't know. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's super, I don't know, kind of eerie to me. Yeah. I think one reason it's so eerie as well is because, you know, in journalism, the standard is if you make an edit to a piece after it's published, like a correction or something, you have to say at the end that, you know, you know, editors know we've made this correction and you have to specify what the correction is. Uh, and that's just for you know transparency and honesty, but I think it's also so that readers who read the original piece um, 
and go back to it. Don't, you know, feel like they've been lied to <laughs> by the journalist. And in these cases, you have this kind of like in the case of Avatar or in the case of this Alicia Keys uh, vocal, you know, mishap at the halftime show, there is no disclaimer that like this content has been edited uh, after the fact. It's been censored in some way. Um, and I think that as long as there's no like now that you have this breakdown of sort of norms and standards around how media gets produced and disseminated, um it is kind of scary that you can have all kinds of corrections that um, completely change content people inter interact with. And if they've already shared it, then like it's, yeah. It makes me wonder what we don't know. Like what, what has changed that we don't know has changed. And um, there's this fruit of the loom conspiracy. Uh, this is in the, what are the, what is the, what is the word for these things? Um, when you Mandela, Mandela effect. Yes. Yeah. The Mandela effect. Um, so uh, the fruit of the loom is classically a Mandela effect. Uh, uh, the Mandela, Rever, you want to define the Mandela effect really quick for Mandela effect. Uh, so it comes from this false memory that a bunch of people in South Africa had about Nelson Mandela dying in prison in like the eighties and he didn't. And it's basically sort of like a, a collective false memory. Yeah. But I maintain that the fruit of the loom thing is, I, I know what I saw. Okay. All. So, so now yeah. there's a famously Nelson Mandela is where it comes from. Uh, the one that probably I mean, might be even more fam the most famous at this point is the movie Shazam. People remember uh, like a Shazam movie starring Sinbad, I believe is how is how it goes. Um, and actually, that never existed. The movie does not exist. Um, starring there's no Shazam starring Sinbad. The Fruit of the Loom one is the you have the cornucopia. So the the, the 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 what is the brand identity of Fruit of the Loom? And people imagine, many people imagine a cornucopia with fruit pouring out of it. And in fact, that allegedly is not true. It has never been true, not even once in the history of Fruit of the Loom. What is actually true is that it is just fruit. There is no cornucopia. And people online, if you go and Google this, like people in comment sections and chat boards about they're losing their mind over this because they truly, myself included, I mean, I've, I, I'm, I remember the cornucopia, right? They truly believe that it existed. Now, there have been people who, um, there was one girl I saw on TikTok, so I have no idea if it's real, but she d dug all the way back into like, you know, clothing that was 20 years old. And, and she shows you a Fruit of the Loom tag that had a cornucopia on it. Um, you know, she swear, like, here it is. It's real. Why are they lying to you about this? And anytime you hear the word they, like, buckle up, you're about to get a, like a sweet conspiracy theory. And the theory here is that they are changing very small sort of trivial things in the world to see like what you're willing to tolerate. And so if we all saw the cornucopia and we all say, no, we saw the cornucopia, um, it definitely existed. And they say, no, it did not. It never existed. Um, and we accept that. Then there's, it's like, th th there's a standard. They can kind of push it further. How far can they push it? The underwear you know? company. The what? The underwear company. Well, can I have push no idea. it further? I have no idea who they what, are. What are they going to get away with next? In, in this scenario. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't know. Well, I don't know. What, I don't know what they, I don't know who they are. I still don't know. But it does, separate from the conspiracy of it all, um, you know, it does beg the question of what we would be willing to tolerate if someone just stares you in the face and says, that's not what happened. It was this totally other thing. Um, and the, and it seems like quite a lot in, is, is my take on this uh river you, you wanted to talk about how you actually believe in the conspiracy theory i do i had like a i think that tiktok actually she like pulls up my tweet where i'm just like i know what i saw it like really went viral on like instagram yeah i it, it may be a different tiktok i don't know like i just see that i see my tweet pop up all the time like on instagram now like it's one of those like meme things that gets recirculated now but yeah i mean i have very distinctive memories of the cornucopia like i and I've seen like, yeah, like I've seen like the old, like people are like finding stuff at Goodwill and they're like, here it is. I don't know. There's, a, <laughs> I can't prove it, but the, it feels like, uh, I don't know, maybe it's some sort of, uh, multi, there's multiple dimensions. I, who, who, I don't know. There's something weird going on though. I, I wonder, it's like, are we, are we kind of, are we recalling something from a, this is, do I believe this? I don't know. So I, I lose track Another sometimes life. of the things that I believe in. Think the things that I enjoy believing. No, this is one where I'm like, like, is it possible that we're recalling? Like, it's like we have memories from a, 
a, a, a parallel universe just next to our parallel universe. You know, it's like just close enough that that there, there's some sort of crossing of wires there. Um, and then I was just, this is like a totally separate thought, which is, do I believe, I don't know that I actually believe that. I sometimes lose myself in the things that are fun to believe. And this is definitely one of those things, but something is happening here and the company is straight up denying it. And that's, that's weird. I, that is very odd to me to have, uh, these mass false memories. And, um, and this is, a uh, yeah, I guess it's like, a, it's an adjacent conversation to the fact that we actually have some real memories that are being altered in real time. And what are the consequences of that? Brandon, you had some interesting thoughts about that, the, the sort of high level um, topic here that you shared in Slack. Yeah, I guess I'm on the fence on your whole theory of things. I think there's kind of a tension between the fact that previous to the internet, there was only like a specific percentage of the information or history was saved in encyclopedia books and actually entered the record versus now i i presume it's safe to say that we save much more information about what happened previously or or what goes in in the record the record is much bigger now right so i think you know maybe there's a trade off here where we're storing way more information but some some of that information is getting modified to um I suppose prop up the regime. I guess that's the theory. Um, so I think that's interesting. I, I also think, you know, Winston Churchill. I think is is attributed to saying history is written written by the winners, and I I don't I don't think what's happening today is an anomaly in history. Well, there are all sorts I, of losers on Wikipedia writing it now. So I I do think that it's quite different. You, all you need is is control of the distribution of information online and a bit of it because it's not like we're recording these things all over the place. And then the Google footprint vanishes. So for the dictionary, so right now, what do you have? You have a dictionary that's digital only that's been altered. The definition has changed. It's now different. It is now officially, you know, by decree, it is rude to say sexual preference. We have articles talking about that change. But Google is in charge of that and things fall off depending on how old they are. And eventually, what do you have? You have this, you have the dominant record says it's offensive. It has always been offensive. You have a bunch of internet sleuths saying, wait a minute, but I found this article from 50 years ago um, that there's only a digital copy of that says this random thing that I want to believe is true. And the natural retort to that is, I don't believe you. I think you made that up because there's no physical record of anything. I have a hardbound collection of uh, encyclopedias or the encyclopedia, I don't even know what the proper nomenclature of this is because we don't use them anymore. Um, but it's for the Encyclopedia Britannica. It's the last one they published. It's in my room in San Francisco. And um, they, there's nothing like that anymore where we could disagree on something, but it's, it, it's a, it's, we're disagreeing on politics, not like what is the entry in the encyclopedia? Just go look it up. Then at least if norms are changing, you could point to it and say, well, the norm changed on this date. Now it's unclear what the norm ever was. That that feels very new to me. Yeah, that's fair. I mean, I keep thinking about how the papacy, when they were running out of money in the 1600s, began selling indulgences, and they were they like wrote a decree, and they were like, "It's cool, like we can just sell your way into heaven." Yeah, right. And people bought indulgences, and I suppose some, some percentage of of Christians were like, "All right, I I, I believe that." But ultimately, that was seen as as folly, and you know now we know that the the, the Lutherans won that that uh, that conflict. So I don't know. I feel like the I feel like the truth or or the, the better way ultimately makes its way out of those situations where you're like your your example is the the definition or the, the that sexual preference that term is is bad. I had never heard that, but I'm I, I feel like in if that if Truly, like most people on the left believe that the word sexual tr- preference is bad. I think we'll ultimately get out of that and realize that that is, we're saying the R word again, aren't we? I don't, so this is the thing. I'm not worried about the sexual preference. Who cares if it becomes, maybe it does. Things change, words change, insult, things become insulting that weren't once. For me, the more important thing is knowing what was offensive when it became offensive, having some real sense of how, of what yeah. people used to say. And we do have a sense of that 
for everything before the year like 2002 or whatever, whenever that r- rough moment in the early 2000s when we started producing more information online about the present day than we did uh, on like physical, tangible, like like papers and things like this. So now, I mean, Pirate Wires is a great example. Pirate Wires is 100% digital. So we could change the record and what is... We, we have, there are very few outlets you can go and, and, and sort of verify what once existed in an article that we published three years ago. We have control of that. And um, there are tools that you have like the Wayback Machine and things like this that you can edit. In fact, uh, famously, we have caught at PowerWise, we've written about certain reporters changing that um, uh, or removing themselves from it. I, I just, I do think it's a new problem and it is an underexplored problem and it's going to cause problems especially like 20 years from now, when we're trying to remember what was really happening in the year 2009, and we have no record that we can trust. We have our memory, which is imperfect, which the Mandela effect, I, and my, my real perspective on the Mandela effect, is it proves that our memories are kind of janky and um, can be influenced by stories we want to believe and by what our friends believe. And we really believe these things that we saw, but we now have proof that we didn't. And... Um, and so it's going to be hard to piece together what happened in our formative years, which seems like a total reversal of what the trend should be, because our assumption is always as the future moves on, we get better at this stuff, not worse. But I think that what we have now is literally worse than paper, which is strange. Yeah, I'm going to be like 80 years old, like telling my like statistically like like gay nephew, like our, Lady Gaga's art pop had an R. Kelly song on it, and they're going to be like, "Okay, Uncle, like, like let's get you to the nursing home," you know? <laughs> like they're not going to believe me. She got rid of it. Did she? So, so she erased it from, oh, like, from the album. Perry had a song called "You're So Gay." Yeah, that starts with "You should hang yourself with a nation home scarf," and they're like, "Okay, sure." I don't think they got <laughs> they haven't got rid of that one yet, but buy the CD because they will eventually. <laughs> um. I want to quickly talk. I know it's a li- it's a slight. This is you know a week old at this point. I want to quickly talk about the Putin uh, Tucker interview, only to get to another topic really quick because they're all kind of connected. But you have um, you have this Putin Tucker interview. Um, media lost its mind over the fact that Tucker was doing this. It's sort of like an assumption that he is spreading Putin propaganda, whatever. Um, Maybe he is, maybe he's not. I have no idea if he's, you know, the, what the relationship is with the Kremlin. I don't know if he gave the questions to Putin ahead of time. What I do know is I sat through two and a half hours of like history. <laughs> like I sat through a long ass, like very thoughtful, even if it's propaganda, the man is able to at least sit down for two and a half hours and make a case for something on behalf of his country. Um, and there are lots of questions about whether or not uh, that interview was a net positive or or, or uh, a negative. What I what I can tell you for sure is I turned I left that I moved from that interview uh, to the news, and Joe Biden was in the middle of a press conference that he held for I think like twenty minutes, in which he was trying to make his case to the American people that he was not senile, and in it he confused the president of Mexico with like another nation. As you know, initially. The president of Mexico, Sisi, did not want to open up the gate to allow humanitarian material to get in. I talked to him. I convinced him to open the gate. I talked to Bibi to open the gate on the Israeli side. You're the president of the United States, and this is your whole thing. This is like, this is your job is to be defending the country. You're the, you are the commander in chief. Um, And it was a very stark and startling juxtaposition uh, between what you know is our apparent enemy abroad and our man at home. And there are only really there. You could read it two ways. Like, if are we is Russia the enemy of the U.S.? Okay, if he is, then our president needs to be just as good as him at least. Um, if he's not, then I'm able to point to him and say, okay, well, can our president be a little more like him? There's no version of this that makes Biden look good. Um, and Biden is not unique in this. I could not picture Donald. I could. I think it would be entertaining to force Donald Trump to sit down and talk to us about history for two and a half hours. But do I think that he would be eloquent and thoughtful and forceful? Um, No. In fact, I can't think of a single person in the country who could, certainly none of the old ones, which very quickly, I want to connect it to the Jon Stewart thing. 
and let's talk about you know all of this. Like if you guys just take any piece of it you want, but uh, John Stewart comes back. We've talked about him on this pod. You know he's coming. He's coming back. I was super negative on it. I thought it was going to be pretty bad because I'd seen some of his Apple stuff and it was atrocious and it was disappointing because he was so good on the COVID leak in China and interesting. And he kind of forced Democrats to a more reasonable a reasonable position, which is a great place for him and a useful tool for the Democrats. Um, he failed at Apple, but then he comes back. And what is his segment? Like a, his killer segment? It's about Biden's age. Um he does it in a really smart way for a Democrat who wants his goal is to get Biden out of the election, to put someone young and formidable in the race. And so he draws an equivalence between Biden and Trump, and he makes fun of them both. Uh, and by the end of the of the interview of, of the of the monologue, you know, he starts with sort of tepid, confused applause. He ends with the audience is on his side. I got to thinking like this guy, um, very good for the Democrats. And he's going to be influential, I think, throughout the next election. Um, so a lot here. You guys, what are your thoughts on any range of these things here? First of all, like the senility question in general of Biden, um, sort of the embarrassing nature of watching him follow Putin, uh, or just the John Stewart thing. Um, like, am I right? Is he going to be, is he back? Is he not back? I don't think I'm John Stewart's target audience, <laughs> to be honest, <laughs> because I'm not like a... I don't know, boomer Democrat. Is that fair to say that that's his sort of target audience? Uh -oh. um, I don't know. I, I thought his monologue was pretty trite. I mean, I guess I have to give him credit for actually pointing out the obvious, which is that Biden is obviously senile and in decline. And as is Trump, of course, I mean, they're both, you know, Biden's past 80, Trump's about to be 80, I think. Um, but I wasn't really, um, I don't know. I, I wasn't really blown away by it. Um, and I do think, you know, Biden just gives me so much secondhand embarrassment. I can't even bear to watch some of his press conferences because it's so, I mean, it's like every other word is a gaffe and doesn't make sense. Um, and it is, it's impossible to imagine Biden speaking coherently for an hour, let alone two hours about anything, uh, let alone, and you know, Putin is, was obviously pushing a very tendentious narrative of history, but at least he was able to sell a narrative about why yeah. he's doing this. And it was an interesting narrative and maybe it wasn't historically accurate, but at least he's got like something uh, that has an emotional appeal in the way that, you know, Biden just repeating NATO talking points, I think doesn't for a lot of people. Well, yeah, he's sitting down and his goal, even if it's, if it's propaganda, he did a good job. He sat, he went in, his goal was for in two and a half hours, I'm going to, convince people in America that I am doing a thing that is in my best interest and I'm no threat to them. And to do that, I'm going to talk about history. I'm going to make myself seem reasonable. I'm going to make fun of Tucker Carlson, who the elites don't like. He's a clown. Clearly, I also think he's a clown. Like He did a great job. If it was just marketing, he did a good job of it. And to your point, Sanjana, I don't think Biden could do that. I don't. I don't. I genuinely do not believe he's capable of doing that. And that is great. He's the president of the United States. Like that's just, it's a huge problem. Yeah. I, I've seen a lot of, uh, think pieces and tweets lately of people beno sort of bemoaning the fact that Republic, it, sometimes it's just Republican. Sometimes it's young Republican. Sometimes it's the new right, whatever people complaining that people on the right, particularly younger people, people online, uh, don't hate Russia and they like Russia and they kind of like Putin. And when you watch that interview, you realize why. It, what Putin was articulating is a vision for a country, which we do not have and we have not had since the collapse of the Soviet Union when we were just like, we won. Okay, now let's have a big garage sale and uh, just sell everything. American, the point of America will be buying a new TV from Korea. Like that, <laughs> I mean, it's it's... Uh, sort of feels so vapid and hopeless. And there's been all these, I, I think, neoconservatism, like the the idea that we're going to, you know, turn uh, all these despotic nations in the Middle East into democracies or whatever. Like that was sort of a an attempt to try to reclaim it, which failed. And now people are sort of trying to do the same thing by, uh, you know, sort of refashioning neoconservatism as like, we're just going to defend, we're going to get involved in every foreign territorial conflict that there is, uh, 
And, you know, that'll be the point of America is just picking sides in these, uh, you know, blood feuds. And it's not working. Like, we have to have a country. Like, what Putin was articulating is a vision of a country, a place with a history and a people and um, a vision for the future, even if that vision is Russian imperialism. Like, maybe people in the West don't like that. But it means something to Russians, particularly after suffering, you know, the humiliation of uh, the, the what happened when the Soviet Union collapsed, which is, you know, these oligarchs uh, come up, Westerners come in, they buy in everything, the economy is wrecked on purpose, and um, people feel humiliate, felt humiliated, and that's why Putin came to power. And I think, in some ways, it's a cautionary tale, because I think if we don't get our shit in order and something, you know, really bad comes along, some sort of economic crisis or something else, we're going to have a Putin-like figure because that's the only thing that will be able to keep the country together is sort of a strong man who has a vision of uh, America that people believe in and people will give up a lot of rights to have some sense of there being a point to this whole thing. Yeah, I think I agree. Uh, well said. Brandon? I don't, you know, I don't have anything to add. I think that's a banger point, River. Um, and I totally agree with that. When I was I was watching it, uh, I tweeted and deleted something like that Norman Rockwell painting because people were making fun of Putin for going on and on about the history of of Russia. And I think my tweet was something like, "I think it's good that a country has a, when a country has a president that can, you know, like talk about history intelligently." And I think River, you, you said it better than I can um, that really symbolizes somebody who's who actually has a, a positive vision for, for their own country and, and I agree we're not we're not getting that from our, our politicians um, on, the, on the other side of things I, I, I could I would address I, I did get some weird vibes from Twitter so I, I, I saw people tweeting that Putin should just simply not be interviewed that Tucker had done something wrong for interviewing Putin at all which I think is a super weird point um, it is a an established tradition in journalism for journalists to uh, interview powerful heads of, of our foreign adversaries. Um, like Mike Wallace interviewed Ayatollah Khomeini literally during the Iran Iranian hostage crisis. Um, Edward Morrow interviewed Khrushchev at the height of the Cold War. Dan Rather interviewed Saddam Hussein right before Desert Storm. The publication Storm. of, a, of, of a Osama bin Laden's op-ed I didn't even, I, I completely missed that yeah, one. It went viral on all the TikTok girlies were like, Osama, he was right. And we had to fucking have a whole discourse about it because yeah, they were, they so, were rediscovering this old op-ed of his from 10 years ago when they were, I guess, still prepubescent and didn't know what was happening or why he was bad. Yeah. My point is to say that I, I found that critique extremely strange and illiberal. Uh, and I, I was basically rubbed the wrong way, but yeah. Good interview. I think people would be wise actually to listen to when they do interview these like despotic figures to listen to what they have to say. Uh, this was something I heard. I can't find this interview. I tried and tried to look for it. Uh, I think Glenn Greenwald or somebody was talking about it. I heard it on a podcast. But in the lead up to the Iraq war, uh, an American journalist did an interview with Saddam Hussein's um, sort of secondhand man. He's this uh, Iraqi Christian guy who was in the Ba'athist party for a long time came up with Saddam and he was the I forget who the journalist was but they were like criticized for that because they were like he's airing out propaganda on national TV and all this but like what the guy was actually saying in the interview was like you don't understand this country like the only thing that is keeping the that is protecting religious minorities in this country and keeping people from killing each other is this sort of secular is like the is Ba'athism is this sort of secular Arab nationalism Without it, you have a massive Shia, these Shia religious fanatics who are backed by Iran who are like going to take over the country. And that's basically what happened. And, and like, if people like that wasn't propaganda, he was actually telling you the truth, you know? And like when Putin says that um, he believes that, you know, he's talking about how he basically believes that Ukraine isn't a real country. You can say this propaganda or whatever, but that's actually what he believes. That's what a lot of Russians believe for and they have reasons for believing that because it wasn't an independent country until the 90s so like 
I, I, I don't know. It's just like this weird. Um, it's almost like I don't. It's not quite anti-intellectualism, but there's this. It's almost like they don't want to understand what people in other how people in other countries think. Um, if those no, if people are not aligned it's a two and with us, interview and, where certainly Putin is going to tell us exactly. He, we have already established that what he cares about is his people, and that is great. Wish I had one of those in America. But certainly, and I agree that there is, we should be able to hear, and is, there's probably some wisdom in hearing what they have to say. The problem is that what he is going to tell us is, is shaped in a specific way to get something that he wants that is not in our interest. It is in his interest. Maybe we're, maybe there's overlap between our interests, but more than likely, there are things that he wants that will be bad for us. And I want to just steel man the other side because it's the same conversation we have for really almost every disinformation story, which is actually, while I think probably the four of us and most of our listeners, I have a lot of faith in our ability to sort of make that that analysis ourselves. There are many people who are not smart enough to make that analysis. They believe everything they hear and it is going, it does lead to really bad negative consequences. Now, I still think in the freedom thing is good. I still believe it, but I don't think we should pretend that there is not some reason that people are upset that Tucker just gave, you know, a two and a half hour platform sort of quite uncritically to Vladimir Putin, other than the end where he was like, uh, hey, can you release this journalist who you're holding hostage? <laughs> and Putin was like, no. And then that was the end of it. Um, I think there's a re you know, I don't want to pretend that there's not that it's like, oh, why would they care about this? Like it's very obvious why they care. At, at the very least, it's obvious why they care. The question of whether or not uh, he should do it is something different, but it's like, let's not pretend that it's, I don't think it's so black and white. I do think um, one thing that's interesting about the Tucker interview specifically is compared to like, is it Dan Rather who interviewed Saddam, uh, mm -hmm. Brandon? Yep. Yeah, is the Tucker interview was not edited uh, very heavily, like whereas the Rather interview is edited for TV. Um, and, you know, um, when Barbara Walters interviewed Fidel, it was edited for TV as well. I thought it was kind of interesting that Tucker just, he, he editorialized a bit at the beginning when he had his uh, monologue, yeah. but then it cut to just him talking to Putin. Um, and Putin was, you know, he went on his supposedly 30 second <laughs> presentation of the history that lasted like half an hour. But I do think that there's a kind of, um, there's a technical point here that might explain to some extent some people's objections, um, which is just that like the, the interview really was presented with no... Um, very little context or, or sort of uh, uh, editing post-production. Yeah, the frame was not given to people and that is scary. And, and the thing is like, I always resist uh, the, the fear of people thinking for themselves is what is behind, you know, most of these efforts to censor. Um, and I resist those efforts and fuck those people. However, <laughs> like it, it, you know, in this freer world that I want and that I think we all want, we have to be real about the fact that you're going to have huge hordes of people who believe in absolutely bananas things that are not based in reality. And in fact, we see that. I do think it's proliferating. I do think the internet is going to be the sort of vector where that happens forever. Um, I don't think you can stop it. I think we have to figure out a way to deal with that. Um, it's sort of like fragmented media ecosystem that we live in. There are two things I want to talk about still left today. I want to talk about a batshit crazy mayor that River wrote about. And I want to talk about Kristen Stewart's androgynous sex pot photo shoot in Rolling Stone. Um, let's start with the mayor. And I'm just, we'll, we'll get to Kristen Stewart, I promise. Yeah, I'm obsessed with this woman. Um, her name is Tiffany Hinyard. She actually has two positions. She's the mayor of Dalton, Illinois, and also the supervisor of uh, Thornton Township. Uh, Dalton is kind of a, it's like a village within Thornton. It's in the uh, South Chicago suburbs. Anyway, this woman, I, I'm just going to read off the list of crazy shit that she's done uh, since she was elected in 2021. This woman has not been in office for very long. She hired a sex offender to do home inspections because he worked on her campaign and uh, then fired him because he talked to a journalist. She puts up these giant billboards advertising city services, but they have her name and her face on them. So it'll be like, yeah, that looks free like some pictures of this with her face on it. And she's like smiling and doing like. <laughs> That's so just she has a fake <laughs> breast. Yeah, she has a fake breast cancer charity, which I feel like is a, that's very classic politician. But she's so over the top with this. She just got subpoenaed by the state attorney of uh, Illinois for not 
basically never filing any paperwork on it, uh, <laughs> despite taking money from the city to fund her private breast cancer charity. Uh, she took a trip to Vegas at the taxpayer's expense and it went to all these different places, like went to Bubba Gump's Shrimp Company. And when she was being questioned <laughs> about it in the town meeting, had the Bubba Gump like shrimp had like on her desk in front of her as she was like denying that she, <laughs> I guess, like didn't spend any money. Uh, let's see. She would show up to a meeting dressed as a uh, Wesley Snipes character from New Jack City. Um, she also has like a DJ who accompanies her to town meetings to kind of accentuate her points with music. So it'll be... It'll, she'll they'll be playing like uh rihanna's bitch better have my money uh like stuff like that um there's more she uh <laughs> she faced a recall uh but she beat it on like some sort of weird technicality like a paperwork thing or something uh and then posted this infographic on instagram that was like i'm your mayor now and forever and it says like it says like recall defeated or something like that <laughs> Uh, she's building a sort of pr uh, Praetorian guard. Uh, she just keeps pulling cops off the street to serve in her personal security detail. This is a town of like 20,000 people, by the way. And so she's being like uh, driven around in black SUVs like the president, like it, it, like a caravan. Uh, the cops are like, <laughs> like keeping journalists from talking to her. She fired her chief of police because his wife was friends with uh, one of her political opponents. What about the one? There, didn't she also uh, change the salary based on yes, whether or so not she, she wins the next election? Yeah, I was about to get to that. Uh, she, yeah, she's uh, for in the township uh, supervisor position, which pays like two hundred something thousand dollars a year, which is kind of crazy for like an elected position. Uh, she successfully passed an ordinance that says. If she loses election, the salary will go from it was like two hundred forty thousand or something to twenty five thousand dollars a year. But if she wins, <laughs> it will stay the that's same. That's crazy. <laughs> that one alone and, for me. That's the that's the one. Yeah. That one. That How one, does she pass something like that? I don't get it. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, uh, uh, she's being sued over it. <laughs> they, like, they're interviewing the lawyer <laughs> on like local Chicago news, and the 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 um what is it called at the bottom? Uh, of the news, Chiron. like for it, oh, Chiron. the what, the Chiron that just says in quotes illegal in so many ways. <laughs> 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 um, what is it about this woman that she's you... starting a podcast too? By the way, uh, which <laughs> I will be listening to. I mean, we all you have to be our first guest. Join the club, yeah. Well, the interviewer. But what do you, what is it about her? I mean, she's really captured your imagination, your heart, your your mind. What what is it about her? She's just, she's camp. Um, she has this relationship. She's like an old school uh, corrupt politician in the way that she's um, giving stuff away. One thing I don't even think I mentioned in the article is that she's in a beef with a lady who runs a local food pantry and is like keeps denying her permits <laughs> to expand her food pantry. Like a legitimate <laughs> like food bank for poor people in a like town that's pretty poor because like she gives away food as like in her capacity as mayor in boxes that have, have her name on it. So she views this this kind-hearted woman who owns a food bank as like a political enemy. But she um she like gives away stuff to people. She's kind of like a tooth fairy figure or something. Um did you uh, say the million but dollar incredibly giveaway corrupt, yet? very River? camp. The oh yeah, yeah, yeah. She said she was doing <laughs> there's see, there's so fucking many. I can't even <laughs> I like made a list. It's like two pages long. Yeah, she announced for um Black History Month, she was doing a million dollar giveaway that had her face on it, and she's making this sign with like a kente cloth thing in the background. And <laughs> it actually turns out <laughs> that it's money from the city, and it's not the total budget is like a million dollars, and it's money for like rent or mortgages or assistance or something. It's that one's actually like the branding is hilarious, like the way that she's like making it seem like some sort of raffle or like lottery or something. Um, but I think it, at the very least, like that's one of the few things I don't think she'll get sued over because she's actually for once using the money somewhat for what it's intended for. Um, but yeah, she, she's also made music videos. I can't argue with you. You mad. I can't argue with you. No. Look at you. Look at 
at you, you man. Look at you, you big man. The Man. phone she was like yeah leave me alone <laughs> it's I, I you're just gonna have to play it i can't i can't remember the words but it's great <laughs> like this woman's instagram is one of the most amazing things i've ever seen and this uh, is another documentary just, opportunity oh, for yeah. us there for has to wires. be one in the works yeah if not you we mentioned in her. the piece it was like at least she does the corruption in public, which Openly. is another person. Yeah. You wrote about George Santos and he was another person who kind of, I mean, I don't know that he did it openly so much as he got exposed and he was like funny when he was exposed. Um, but there's something maybe weirdly charming about these people because it's just so clear cut. And also everyone agrees. Like they, like they do these crazy things and you don't have half the country defending them. It's just like, we can all agree this is really bad. And it's also funny. And then it's it's just, you know, we move on. Meanwhile, Nancy Pelosi's uh stock what is what is it? It's She's like She's the Warren Buffett of her uh generation. <laughs> I will say yeah. on that though. She's beat I the market by like five hundred percent or something. <laughs> yeah. It's a little weird, but it's kind of don't you want your don't you want your senators and congressmen economically aligned with the country? I do. I don't want them to be able to bet against it. I don't want them to be able to short these things. I think that's really crazy. Um, but I think that they should be able, they should almost maybe be forced to invest in like just uh, index. The funds. worst companies imaginable. <laughs> well, index. Funds. They should have let's, cross. Let's do Let's do them all. They have to invest in like, I don't know, like the fortune 500 or something. Um, yeah, no, I mean, they should just like have their money should just go into a blind trust. It's just like in the S and P or something. Yeah. Yeah. And you also mentioned, and this is where I also disagree. Uh, well, the only place really that I, I think I disagree, uh, it is a weird off. It has nothing to do with her. I agree that she's awesome. I'm terrible, but awesome. Uh, the, it's too much money for the mayor to be making, right? Like what is it? 200,000. I think that these people, we need to have like 30%. We need to cut the entire workforce of the government by like two thirds and give everybody else an increase in pay because we are not incentivizing good people into these positions. And, um, you know, why did she cut the salary down to 25K if she loses? She's trying to kill her competition because she is actually correct that if she does that, it will lower the incentive to run. And so we all, it's weird. Like we all look at this in the wealthiest country in human history. We know that we are not incentivizing good, smart people to go into these positions. And we seem to not care about it. I always think about this in the context of the president. Like, would we really be having this Joe Biden, Donald Trump conversation? This question of should we or should we not have an 80 year old in office who can barely string a sentence together if we simply paid the president like $10 million a year? I think that you would a lot of really talented people would do a lot to get that to get that position, um, and it would solve a lot of problems. And it's like, oh, but we can't pay the government a lot of money. I think we just fire a lot of people. No, am I crazy? Mm, I mean, like Donald Trump already has a lot of money, so he still wants to be president. You know, yeah, it's a very rare person that it attracts. It attracts a megalomaniac who money's not enough; they need power. But we need people who are incentivized by money because that's ninety nine point nine percent of human beings and they're right now all doing very lucrative things in business where they are actually providing a lot of value and doing a lot of good and running businesses in a way uh, that is very efficient and very helpful and I think that you want to get those people into government rather than have to rely on the you know the random one-off um you know will he won't he dictator I think that only that only works if you close off the means of like corrupt activities too like Presumably Nancy Pelosi, I don't know, you know, if what she's doing is completely above board with her stock trading, but it, it seems a little sketchy to me um, because like, I don't know, Hillary Clinton, Elizabeth Warren, a lot of politicians are millionaires because they're politicians. So they they were millionaires yep. after they became politicians via speaking fees, um, cons consultant gigs and, and all that. So I think you would like it's already really lucrative to go into politics if i think if you're a certain not local politics but i mean 
I don't, I don't actually, I don't know the facts. Yeah. yeah. Like your, but national your politics here is, is not making anything. They can't even afford to live in DC, which is why the recent issue of their salary increase came up and people freaked out. This is a classic right wing thing. And I get it to be like, how dare like, why do you want $200,000 or something to, to go and run the government when the median income of Americans is blah, blah, blah. And that's what it should be. But I don't think it should be. I don't think that we should be paying uh, congressmen what we pay janitors. I think that it should be actually like an elite position and you get a lot to do it. And yeah, we're really hard on the corruption side, but you get a great salary. And I just, we we do seem to have a problem of attracting good people to those to those positions, and the congressman is like that's president. Yes, those huge sexy positions, all sorts of room to make money after them. Senators, a lot of them, uh, but then you go down to congressmen, and we're not even yet talking about all of the people who actually run the government. Right, they're not the unelected positions that run the day to day sort of like machine, and then you get into local politics, and it's a complete nightmare in terms of the kind of people that you're attracting. It's like all of that needs to be harder to get into if we want yeah. these things to function. I can get behind that. You get paid a million dollars a year to be a congressman, but you have to delete the Robin Hood account. Like <laughs> <laughs> Or it's like, like a scale. Like as you get more powerful, your salary becomes lower. But at the ground floor, ground level, you're getting paid a lot of money for the people who actually run things, who are there voting every day. Yeah, then so, in like a city like San Francisco, you just fire two thirds of the people working for the because they're literally not doing anything. They're going to work, they're fucking around on their computer, and they're going home. They're collecting a paycheck and a pension um, for the rest of their lives. So, no. Uh, I really, like, from the core of my being, need to talk about Kristen Stewart. Um, I actually, I mean, Sanjana River, who wants to who wants to break it down for us what, what happened? Okay. I mean, basically, Kristen Stewart just had a cover shoot for Rolling Stone that came out yesterday. Um, I mean, she she gave a long interview basically where she's promoting this lesbian movie she's in that's apparently coming out in a few weeks, uh, which has the tackiest movie title I've heard in a while called Love Lies Bleeding. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> um, oh, God. But... Yeah, I mean, basically, Kristen Stewart uh, is a lesbian and or she's dating a woman. I guess her fiance is a woman and she is doing this photo shoot uh, as a super androgynous woman wearing like a jock strap. She's got pictures of herself doing she got a uh, mullet. pull up. Yeah, she's got a mullet. She's doing pull ups. She's like grabbing her crotch. Uh, she's topless at one point and turned uh, backs or backs towards the camera. Looks very androgynous. And the interview, the title of the interview is Kristen Stewart saying, like, I want to do the gayest fucking thing you've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> and that's like the that's what the the article is called. Uh, so pictures of Kristen Stewart go viral on Twitter. And there's a lot of pushback from, I guess, right wing influencers on Twitter who are basically saying that this is what wokeness does to people. So like you have a. Uh, Ian Miles Chong, who apparently is not has not yet been sentenced Who's maybe I guess, about for to sedition. be arrested by the um, by the government of guy? Malaysia for in, for what is it like some anyway we'll I get to that later. The sedition, yeah, unclear what happened or if people were just <laughs> calling him to be arrested. But he said, "I don't wish him death, but I don't wish him well either." That's all. I'm <laughs> so so Ian posts <laughs> this picture of Cillian Murphy on the cover of uh, of GQ, and uh, is that how you say it, Cillian? Anyway, Christian Stewart. Yeah. And uh, he says, what's with this new gender bending trend all over the media? Men are women and women are men. When does Cillian, this train stop? You no, know, Cillian Murphy catching <laughs> strays. Like he's just trying to like live his life. Yeah. <laughs> like, skinny Irish guy. And, he just uh, had that. He does have like a signed female at birth face a little bit, but uh, uh, like that's just his face. <laughs> <laughs> it's not, he wasn't even really dressed on androgynous. Yeah, and then uh, Chris Russo, um, or Rufo, sorry, makes a, he says, he makes a comparison between Ellen Page and Kristen Stewart. Um, he says, uh, they put digital pictures of Ellen Page or Kristen Stewart under headlines with words like joy, family, happiness, propaganda that intends to demoralize uh, and sort of compares, I guess, Kristen Stewart's photo shoot with uh, Elliot Page on the cover of Esquire. Um, so there's this whole firestorm basically about Kristen Stewart. My broad take on it is just Kristen Stewart to me looks like a lesbian doing lesbian things. 
<laughs> and I think the comparison with her and Elliot Page is kind of pernicious, actually, because like Kristen Stewart is actually decidedly not doing the Elliot Page thing of yeah. like transitioning medically and you know Elliot Page honestly could have just been like a an androgynous or butch lesbian or something um but chose to go down the medical path and Kristen Stewart is doing something different and they're really not the same like one person is on cross-sex hormones the rest of their lives and got a mastectomy and did all these interventions and Kristen Stewart is just being an androgynous woman and yet it provokes the same reaction, clearly, uh, from from some people. Yeah, I hate the idea that Kristen Stewart is doing something fundamentally new. I think that her photo shoot was purposely provocative, um, but she's not doing... We've had androgynous women forever, uh, famously, f like f for, you know, pl beyond even in the 19th century, right? Like the, you had these, these uh, famous portraits of like women in like a suit and a top hat or whatever doing whatever it is that i don't know like this is we've seen this we've seen it again and again and again and uh she is a lesbian and lesbians exist and she has been a lesbian for a long time uh i i don't think that it's well then again i think maybe the problem here is we just kind of we like forgot that people think that gay stuff is also bad um and like that's what we're looking at here is a reaction i don't think wokeness did that to her i think that she is that is what she is um it it's she was androgynous too it wasn't even like hard butch you know i i i uh, my best friend uh since high school is a very very butch lesbian and so is her sister and i live with them like i've been around like real butch lesbians where they're like hey can i borrow your clothes <laughs> like like type of thing and like that's not really what like kristen stewart was doing like i don't think anybody would have really mistook her for like man necessarily and she still no. she had a mullet and it, it, i don't know she's like a, she's hot like she looks hot and like it and i i don't really uh i think that that's actually what bothered people is that she does look she has like she has a nice body she's there's like something kind of like sensual about her it's not actually like the gross like you know green haired like asexual gender fuck shit that people have been doing for a long time now for like purely political reasons that have nothing to do with sex like the, that photo shoot like drip sex and i think that's yeah. actually what triggered people a little bit is like they were like Ugh, like like they did it they hadn't seen something like that in a while. They hadn't seen somebody pull off the androgynous thing in like a sexy way. And I think it um, uh, made a lot of people uh, bothered. She had that jacket. That. There's something psychological going on. Over her breasts um, in a way that is like classically feminine. And uh, like you see this in in sort of straight, straighter photo shoots uh, quite a lot. And um, that I agree. It's like, what is really like, what is actually the man part of her? Like, there's nothing like she's wearing a jock strap, but it's like a cute that she has a mullet, but like it's still long hair. It's a weird haircut, but she she hasn't changed her body to be she's not like distorted her body chemically or physically with surgery or whatever else. Um, she's just giving something that we haven't seen in a minute because there's been a lot of lesbian erasure. <laughs> the last like over the last five years um like we just straight up forgot that softball players existed but guess what <laughs> folks <laughs> they're here and they're queer and they're not going anywhere no matter how bad it makes you um brandon Kink were as, doing stuff like this in the early aughts and she's not even a lesbian right yeah, <laughs> yeah and yeah. people loved it brandon i want to know um you are the uh you're a straight guy man like you're our we gotta i think there's an open question right now and this is hard I, in the comments i really need to hear this too and I feel like I'm this one I'm going to get I know I'm going to get roasted. Uh is she actually is she hot? Is this hot? Is it not? Is it confusing? Is it hot in a confusing way? Is it I know you're also married so maybe you can't talk about it. I will just say that Matt, our video guy, he did comment on this before it started. I want to represent him. He's like your he's a he's a, another straight guy and he like a hundred, another 100% 100 straight guy I should say. And he um did not find it hot, but was a caveat. And he's like, this is not disgusting. It's like, I just am interested in a different kind of girl. Um, Bran, what do you think? I don't Are care, man. I, I don't know. Uh, allowed to say that's the real no, thing. I'm, I'm perfectly allowed to say I, 
I just don't, I, I like don't, I don't have a take. I, I guess my, uh, what my experience of this was I, I saw one tweet and I'm more interested in that Ian Michael Chong guy, but yeah. um, what, <laughs> anyways, uh, yeah. So I saw a side by side of the Rolling Stone Kristen Stewart with Twilight Kristen Stewart, where Twilight Kristen Stewart looks much more, I don't know, wholesome and like all American, oh, maybe. I, you could see it in her eyes. You, I always knew she was a lesbian. Okay. Yeah, she's got and, the, and she straighter. She looks camera. straighter, I suppose. I, I would say, and to me, she's hotter in Twilight. But I like Matt. Like I, I understand. I mean, I could, I could also be attracted to the uh, the Rolling Stone Kristen Kristen Stewart. What does he? I, I think this is like a, this is just a tribal situation. I think there's also the potential that Kristen Stewart look like is on generally the 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 right side of the culture war like the, what you brought yeah. up sanji about like how elliot page i keep wanting to say elliot smith elliot page um literally transitioned medically um les lesbians are like no i'm a lesbian not trans right and so i can see like Kristen maybe is sort of that type of person. Oh yeah. You know that she really... has closeted turf views like a hundred percent. Right. That, oh yeah. Maybe, like, yes. Kristen Stewart, you get her alone and she's like, we got to get these trans people out of lesbian bars. Like a hundred percent. I used to, I used to, um, I used to see her in Los Feliz uh, at bars getting trashed, not lesbian bars. Cause I didn't go to those, but normal bars. That's my own. That's my, my other. Yeah, she take. seems cool. This, I just, I would public. like to hang out with Kristen Stewart. And that's <laughs> yeah, my official I, opinion. I, I'm surprised that people were bringing up the Twilight uh, pictures as like, oh, she was so much hotter before because she, I've always felt like she looked kind of uh, dowdy a little bit in those in Twilight. If you want like peak feminine uh, Kristen Stewart, you have to go to Spencer where she played Princess Diana and looked gorgeous and also weirdly like Princess Diana in a way that I didn't expect. But See, they don't have any culture. They don't even know that she played. That's too much Diane. of a deep cut. I think. I <laughs> let's cap it off. Actually, research. Miles, let's uh, like. I know that we none of us have prepared to talk about any of Miles Chong, um, but I saw like massive trend yesterday um, about like the like people just rooting for him to die. Like super excited about him being executed by the government of Malaysia. Uh, Ian Miles Chong is this Malaysian influence i think it's malaysia right a Mal he's a yeah. malaysian mm -hmm. influencer he's mm -hmm. never from what i've read he's never been to america he's he, a huge sort of right-wing account online and uh he just caught like you know he's on every single elon musk tweet like with a comment and uh he's got like all of your sort of hard right opinions that he's he's sending out there but for some reason he crossed the the uh the people of his nation with his israel palestine takes which i believe are maybe too pro israel I, is was my yeah. sense of the controversy he was too pro israel and um they're <laughs> trying to have him tried for sedition and um that's just fucking crazy <laughs> like everything about him is crazy to me the fact that he exists the fact that he writes about a country he's never been to the fact that he's so popular the fact that he's now maybe going to be put in jail um thoughts about ian miles chong yeah, I just think he's a really interesting specimen. He's an interesting phenomenon. Like the fact that this guy can exist. He's got tons of followers like on on Twitter. He has um yeah, almost a million followers. And he basically spends all day amplifying just red meat for the culture wars uh content in the context of mainly the US and Canada because I think he works for uh does he work for Rebel News or am I I might be wrong about that, but he he talks a lot about stuff going on in, in the U.S. and Canada, and it's like, of course, this Israel-Palestine issue. He's he's you know amplifying right-wing talking points, American right-wing talking points about it, um, in a way that falls afoul of Malaysia's majority Muslim population, and it's just like bizarre. And I mean, it's not hilarious because I I do think it's kind of. <laughs> It's kind of bad that people are actually calling for him to be charged with sedition. Um, but he's a weirdo, I think. Uh, so I think you know. we just to clarify, I'm looking at a Time Magazine article from yesterday, and this is apparently just a big rumor. And Chong denies that anything 
is happening to him that the government has taken any action against is it, him. Was so. it just a, a crazy viral joke? I think it was, it was a viral, there was one viral tweet and everybody started making memes about him getting executed but the and viral, his face. The viral, <laughs> the thing that's funny about it is like there's so, people hate this guy so much that all it took was one article that literally said Malaysian netizens are calling for him to be tried with sedition. Like there was no evidence that this had actually been heard by anyone in the Malaysian government. There's no <laughs> evidence there was like a movement for this to happen. It was just like a bunch of people in Malaysia were like, let's get this guy tried for sedition. And then everyone on Twitter is like, yeah, fuck Ian Miles John. <laughs> Um, it, it would and be actually crazy on his Kristen Mal- Stewart tweet, go on, sorry, go I was ahead, saying on ahead. his Kristen Stewart tweet, there's all these people who are commenting like, Ian would never have said this when he was alive. <laughs> like, <no. laughs> um, it would yeah. be crazy if the Malaysians did it just to like get an internet win because you don't hear about them much. You know what I mean? Like they did it as I like mean, it, maybe some sort of tourism thing. They're like, <laughs> they're like, come <laughs> see his public execution. They'll do like, they'll build like an Olympic <laughs> stadium for it or you know it sounds it sounds like in december malaysian police did arrest a 36 year old guy for supporting the establishment of malaysia israel ties according to time magazine so uh it's not it's not out of the realm of possibility that any closing thoughts on uh on ian miles chong um on christian stewart on the hotness or not of Kristen, on vladimir putin on the giant Hor- the was it the the ripped Vladimir ripped he was not ripped I but the Vladimir Putin on the horse shot um nothing <laughs> I'm just babbling at this point guys it's been real I want you to get in the comments and tell me if Kristen Stewart is hot or not <laughs> I'll talk to you next week later sorry we're back we, told, <laughs> we like this is a red alert for Pirate Wires <laughs> um yesterday tweet goes out about a preschool teacher who gets fired and this is all the tweet says preschool teacher fired for like an only fans account okay the picture that is linked like no comment at all is of one rachel dolezal um you click in and i learned a lot that i didn't know i, I didn't know that rachel had i didn't know she was a teacher uh i didn't know that she had an only fans account i didn't know that she changed her name to what is it sanjana uh, it is Nikechi Diallo. So Rachel Dolezal, for anyone who is just crawling out of Iraq and were completely forgets, Mandela affected away, I don't know. Um, this is the woman who went down for being white, but pretending she was black and like running the NAACP in her hometown or whatever it was. Um, and then instead of like just saying sorry or pretending it didn't happen or just going away, uh, she came out as transracial <laughs> and, and <laughs> in so doing... Po- totally and permanently infuriated um well the left the the right was sort of anti her until this happened and then i think that I, my gauge of the right at that point was like kind of how it felt about Kristen stewart like didn't know how to deal with it mind blown like can no longer talk about it but rachel's the butt of every joke online now i feel at this point bad for her um i don't know rough thoughts about rachel's only fans firing yeah, I feel badly for her. It is kind of a bizarre choice to make when you get like globally lampooned for lying about your identity and you then I guess go underground and start teaching. She's working in an after she was working in an after school program, I think. Um and changed her name and, you know, moved states and things like that to then do an OnlyFans account. Um it just seems like a bad decision to make cuz I would think you'd get exposed eventually. Like people are going to recognize you. Um, so yeah. I mean, she's clearly mentally unwell. I, I don't think, think so. I, I don't know. I've seen her. I mean, that interviews. is some extremely poor decision making. You're a preschool Dude, teacher. She's got a great body for a woman of her age. You looked at her. It takes fans? a little bit of mental wellness to, you know, go to the gym. Ju- she's clearly in the gym. She's, you Do know, we know her subscriber she's still count? keeping up the transracial shit. She's dug her heels in. That's why I respect her. Yeah. Because most yeah. people would be like, I'm going to find, I, sorry. I'll go back to being a white woman, but she was like, "Nope, I'm not doing it. I am black." And I, I was, kind of respect it. There's this one like formal, very formal seeming interview of hers, and it's not. It wasn't with what's her face on the Today Show, but in my mind, I remember it that way. It was like some like very elite kind of day to daytime talk show host who is ex- talking to her about her 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 transracialism, and she really had to like she made the case 
um it was crazy and wrong but she made it it was uh um i mean someone someone had to do it i guess there someone was a, had to be the first. there was a documentary about her that i watched uh I kind of feel bad for her a little bit because like her reasons for doing it are weirdly like psychological. Like basically her parents were her telling of it anyway, which seemed genuine is that her parents were super abusive, but she had all these like adopted black siblings from Africa and they were like really, really close. And so she was just like, it, it was like a weird coping mechanism or something to like, I want to be like my siblings because they're like the only people I have or so. It was like, it seemed very sad, but, um, I mean, she never tell you that my husband. Okay, so I brought up Rachel Dole's or I brought up Condoleezza Rice one time, the former Secretary of State under Bush. I can't remember what I said. It's so something about Condoleezza. Oh no, we're watching the uh, racial draft, like that famous Dave Chappelle bit, and they brought up Condoleezza Rice. He was like, "Isn't that that uh, that lady who pretended to be black?" And I was like, "You mean Rachel Dole is on?" He was like. <laughs> no, Condoleezza Rice. I was like, no. <laughs> I was like, the Secretary of State. And he was like, yeah. I was like, baby, no. Like, I was like, you thought that the Secretary of State, like our chief architect of the Iraq War, millions dead, was a white woman pretending to be a black woman. And like, we just moved on from that. I was like, we would never talk about anything else. <laughs> <laughs> you truly believed it. Man. Uh, it seems like a peaceful state of mind, though. Like I, I know. He sleeps well at night. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I feel bad for Rachel, man. I think I that for she, son. for whatever reason, she did what she did and then got caught up in the trans stuff, like many sort of unsuspecting to online people. But just took it to a weird place <laughs> that pissed off everybody um and she became this she's this kind of person who we all agree it's okay to hate which ian miles strong is very different because ian miles strong is um he's out there every single day I, I i like he's he's making a case for a politics that maybe you don't like rachel's not she's kind of living her own life for the she's not a she's not like on twitter every day talking she's not um like a politician she's not famous she's not rich um but she is she's, famous. Well, she, you're right. Yes, she's, she's infamous. Um, but she's not like, yeah, she's not like a celebrity who's getting lots of positive attention and we're mad about it. Like, she just, um, she's a witch that we burned. And now it's kind of happening again. It is, she does do it to herself. Well, like, she, she has really, an OnlyFans. Like, yeah, there, she there's does. no way that people <laughs> su subscribe to her didn't know that she was Rachel Dolezal. I have questions yeah, about the people who subscribe. Single black mother what what are they into? You've got kids to feed. <laughs> you know that they're into Rachel Dolezal, the, the subscribers. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I mean, there's, interesting... you have a niche. You're into trans racial porn. There's exactly one oh, woman. Exactly. For yeah. She's, she owns the market for sure. She's zero to one, baby. She's a <laughs> monopoly company. She's dominating the market. Uh, no one can follow her. I yeah I remember we might have to edit this out because it might be a little too hot for YouTube but I remember on like seeing this guy getting ratioed to death on Black Twitter like a year ago because her OnlyFans have been out for a while it was she, like she was <laughs> launching her OnlyFans and he like quote tweeted and he was like R and like he was just getting ratio and they were coming for him so bad and I was like you know what live your truth man if I feel <laughs> I don't know it. I feel very not a part. This has nothing to do with me. I didn't say it. I didn't endorse it. I don't understand. I don't know it. if it is. I haven't seen it, but I'm just you know. He seemed um, like his honest assessment, and he stood by it. He did not delete the tweet. Well, guys, it's been real. Um, I'll see you next week. Uh, I was trying to think of something funny to say, but there's who can follow Rachel Dolezal. Um, Godspeed. <laughs>